Good morning and welcome to our webinar this morning. We will be beginning in about one minute. Thank you for your patience. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this morning's webinar to Offshore or Reshore, How to Objectively Decide. My name is Al Spada. On behalf of the American Foundry Society, I'd like to thank you for taking time to listen to this webinar this morning. Our speaker this morning is Harry Moser, founder and president of the Reshoring Initiative. Uh, if you have been paying attention to the mainstream press, Harry has been all over the place talking about the Reshoring Initiative and the surge in reshoring of cast components and other manufacturing components back to the U.S since the end of the recession. Um, Harry is a recent inductee to Industry Elite's Manufacturing Hall of Fame. He was Quality Magazine's Professional of the Year in 2012. He was a recipient of Manufacturing Leadership Council's Industry Advocacy Award in 2014. Um, he has a, Harry has a 47-year career in manufacturing, including six years in the metal casting industry as part of DESA. He also worked for George Fisher in their EDM and high-speed milling machine tools business where he was president in 1985 and retired as Chairman Emeritus in December of 2010. Harry has a BS in Mechanical Engineering and an MS in Engineering from MIT and an MBA from the University of Chicago in 1981. Uh, American Foundry Society started, first started working with Harry two years ago when we became a bronze level sponsor of the Rinshoring Initiative. And we're excited to have him here today to give the webinar to offshore or reshore how to objectively decide. Harry, I will turn the microphone over to you, and thank you very much. Thank you, Al. That's a very generous uh, introduction. Uh, first, a, a couple of additions to what Al said. Uh, Al said, I've been all over talking. In addition to talking, we, we do. We actually work with companies. We work with states. We work with uh, anybody that'll, that's interested to help them make better decisions and actually decide to bring work back. So there'll be more work for you. Uh, also, the uh, my history with AFS goes back to when I was with DISA. I guess this is 25 years ago, and I wrote articles and gave speeches and did whatever back then. So I've got a, a long tradition. In fact, uh, a little more story. I grew up in Elizabeth, New Jersey, and the, the, the biggest factory in town was Singer Sewing Machine. In fact, it was the biggest building in the world at the time when, when everybody had a sewing machine and, and the U.S. dominated world manufacturing. And, and my grandfather was a foreman there. My, my dad ran about a third of the factory, including the foundry. And I worked there summers in high school and college. And I drove past 10 years ago, and it's all gone. Everything's made outside the United States. And I cried then for what we had lost, but what the city, my family, the, the country had lost, all the workers had lost. That, that all that was no longer there. And when I sold uh, Dizomatics and, and later machine tools, I came to great US company after company that was boarded up and gone. And, and I said, well, eventually someone has to do something about this. And, and I, I, I'm the somebody. And 
and, and you're the somebody's too, because our job is to help you uh, make this happen. So Al mentioned the, the title, and it's the title you see up here, the, the uh, to offshore or reshore, how to objectively decide. And that's, you know, if, if you're buying a, a core box or a mold, and, and you can decide to get it domestically or offshore, it's, it's for you to objectively decide. We're, we're going to help you make a better decision on that. But perhaps even more so for you, it's to offshore or reshore how to help your customer objectively decide. So, so we will be providing you with tools and information that should help you make better sales arguments with your customers and, and help them see the economic advantages of sourcing more of their castings here in the U.S. instead of offshore. Let's see now. I'm aging down. Okay. Uh, so a couple of couple of definitions first. Reshoring, backshoring, onshoring, insourcing, homeshoring, rightshoring, nextshoring. Uh, everybody uses all these different words. They all mean roughly the same thing. Uh, bringing back the manufacturer of products that will be sold or assembled here. So it. Uh, and that can be done by the OEM, who makes the decision, GE, General Motors. It can be done by their suppliers, such as, such as yourselves. The, uh, the, the overlying logic of it is that there are huge economic advantages of producing near the consumer, near the marketplace. The transplants, like Toyota and Honda coming to the US, BMW, they're following the same logic, finding that it makes most sense to make the product for North America in North America rather than making it offshore and shipping it here. Caterpillar calls it localization. The, the, the map now shows the, uh, what, what this is all about. The, the green is reshoring, bring it back to the U.S., and, and the blue would be nearshoring, bring it back to, to Canada or Mexico. Offshoring would be everywhere else in the world. And, and the, my first priority is to bring it back to U.S. You know, I'm here. U.S. is supporting us. But, but there is sometimes logic to bring it back to Canada or realistically more likely Mexico. And why is that? Because now the wage rates over here in China have risen so much that the wages are just about the same as in Mexico. But the distance from China is dramatically higher than from Mexico. The time zone, all, all these things, intellectual property, are, are different. And therefore, there's, there's a certain logic to, to things coming back to Mexico. Now, for, again, first choice U.S., but if, if you have a product that's being assembled in the U.S. and some of the components are so labor-intensive that it's a choice, it's either going to stay in China or it's going back to Mexico, I'd rather have it come back to Mexico because if they're going to uh, make something in Mexico, they're much more likely to buy the tooling, much more likely to uh, get consultants, much more likely to get materials from the U.S. than the Chinese would be. So first choice, U U.S., second choice, NAFTA, uh, third choice, the, basically the rest of the world. Uh, for another perspective on this, if, if, a, if you have a factory or if your customer has a factory in Brazil and it supplies South America, then from the perspective of that company and that factory, reshoring is bringing it back to Brazil, and nearshoring is bringing it back to the rest of South America, and, and offshoring is everywhere else in the world, including the US. So, so I put this up here to emphasize that, that at its essence, the reshoring and total cost of ownership are economic logic and common sense that apply and work everywhere in the world. A lot of the work that went offshore, you know, that you lost when it went offshore, went there for due to flawed company economic logic. The the companies applied simple or rudimentary total cost models, uh, mo most simplistically wage arbitrage. For example, Jack Welch once famously said, "I would like to put all of my factories on barges, move them to the port." that has the lowest wage and sufficient technology, sufficient skill, and when the wages grow up in the area, move it to the next port, then move it to the next country, then move it to the next continent, and always stay ahead of that rising wage curve. He never did it. No one's ever done it that I know of. A little more sophisticated, but still very primitive, would be purchase price variance. The, the buyer used to buy that casting for $50, and now he or she is, is supposed to buy it for 48 or 47 or something like that. 
the difference is that purchase price variance, and that's how they're measured. And, that, and that's what is most common in, in industry. A little more sophisticated landed cost, that, that purchase price plus duty freight and perhaps packaging. Uh, some people talk about total landed costs that might throw in a, a few more factors, whereas we talk about total cost of ownership that has perhaps 29 cost factors, costs, risks, strategic impacts. And the difference between uh, landed cost or purchase price variance and, and uh, looking at total cost is, is on the order of 20%. And so the, the companies that are thinking that their cost is 10, but it's really 12 or it's really 13, are in many cases making the wrong decision, especially today. The, to, when, when they did it, when they went offshore 15 years ago, the wages were so low in China that perhaps despite making the wrong, doing the wrong math, they might have made the wrong, the right decision. But times have changed. So this, this chart shows the indexed unit labor cost in manufacturing in a variety of countries. And, and, and I think the two to focus on are, are the US and, and China. And so the definition of this is that their, their unit labor cost, meaning the, the labor cost per unit of production for all the countries were indexed back to 100 in the year 2000. And then going forward each year, the, the index is increased by the percentage increase in the local uh, wage expressed in the local currency. Uh, times the percentage increase in the currency relative to the U.S. dollar, and then divided by the change in the productivity. So U.S. is easy to understand. We had uh, roughly 2% uh, wage increases, roughly 2% productivity. Uh, the U.S. dollar stayed constant relative to the U.S. dollar, and therefore it stayed roughly at 100. Whereas in the case of China, it's up to 320. So the, uh, wh and why is that? The, the Chinese wages uh, have risen in, in yuan at about 15% per year, and the Chinese currency has risen at about 3% per year relative to the dollar until the last few months. And so you have something on the order of 18% annual increase in US dollar cost of, China, of Chinese goods. And when, again, why is that? They've had their uh, one-child policy in effect for 35, 36 years, and so the uh, supply of labor is dropping. Each year it drops by about 3.5 million workers. And at the same time, the demand for labor is going up. The, uh, the standard of living is rising at 6, 7, 8 percent a year. And so the people want more services. They want more domestically made product. D demand is up. Supply is down. Price goes up. It's not, not going to change anytime soon unless they have a horrible uh, depression over there because that demographic dynamic is so strong. So as, as a result of this and oil costs and other factors that have come into play, uh, Boston Consulting Group has written extensively on the subject and concluded that we should expect a uh, manufacturing to return to the US, that, that the US is now the most cost competitive of the developed countries, and specifically that uh, costs for China and the US would converge by about 2015. Now, they did not mean that the labor cost per hour would converge. They did not even mean that the labor cost per unit of output or the, or the index the labor cost, that that, that that would converge. What they meant was that where the uh, Chinese wage 15 years ago was so small you almost couldn't measure it, that that's come up far enough that when you adjust it now for the roughly three to one productivity differential between China and the US, that that labor cost per unit of output gets close enough to the US level that when you, as they say here, take a hard look at the total costs, when you add up all these factors that the companies initially ignored, that that total of labor costs plus hidden costs, as we call them, will now be will be higher by about 2015 for the southeastern US and Texas than for uh, China. So it won't be cheaper to make things in the US than in China, but it'll be that the manufacturing costs will be close enough that when you look at the difference in the overhead, that it will make more sense to make the things here than to import them in a range of industries that they call the tipping point industries. 
So the Reshoring Initiative, the group that, that I represent and lead, uh, provides a, a series of tools and data to take advantage of this and, and to drive this. We, we have the Total Cost of Ownership, TCO, estimator software on our website. It's free there for you to use. And, and in effect, it, it helps you understand or quantify all those hidden costs for US production, for example, your production, and work with your customer, for example, to uh, quantify them for his offshore source and then compare them. So instead of having a bunch of costs and a bunch of risks and strategic implications just sort of in a li listed somewhere, it helps you quantify all of those and come up with one number, the total cost of ownership, so that makes it easy for you or your customer to make that analysis. We also have a library. It's uh, just past 1,000 reshoring articles or articles about reshoring. Most of them have actual cases listed in them. And so you can go to that, again, for free on the library. And you could go in and sort by the state in which you're located, the industry that you serve, uh, perhaps the main advantage that you bring, like delivery or quality or, or some such, and, and then find the articles that list cases that uh, mention all of those, and thereby find companies to sell to. And why would you want to sell to those companies? Because they have demonstrated that they intend to stay here. What's the demonstration? They've reshored. They intend to stay here. Uh, second, they, uh, they presumably have more need for product or for supplies because having reshored, they've increased their production. So whom would you like to sell to? Someone who's committed to staying here and is increasing his production here. We have a case studies template where you can report your cases. So uh, I'll encourage you now, and I'll do this at, again at the end of the webinar, encourage you to report when you reshore. So when you get an order from someone and, and they had been buying those castings from offshore before, or they had been producing their assembly offshore and therefore sourcing the castings offshore, and now they're producing the assembly here and sourcing the castings here, when you do that, or when you decide to get your tooling, for example, made in the US instead of offshore. You go onto our website, you report that case, and, it, and you create a, a, a PDF that tells that story. And we post it, you post it, maybe we can get Al to post it on the, on the AFS website. So the idea is to, to make as visible as possible the fact that castings are now increasingly competitive in the US. And the more of the buyers and, and supply chain people that see that, the more that they'll consider coming to you instead of just de facto heading for India or somewhere else offshore. The last item on this list, motivation for skilled manufacturing careers. We, most manufacturing industries have a shortage, especially of skilled technologists, tool makers, precision machinists, uh, foundry technicians. You know, hard to find all these people with those skills. And why is that? The, the, the smart high school student for the last decade or two read about offshoring and, and post-industrial society, and, and their uncle lost the job at the mill. So why would they want to go in and go through a, an extensive training to go into manufacturing if manufacturing was all going away? So, so for reshoring to happen, we need much better recruiting, smarter, more, better trained. But for recruiting to happen, society, the guidance counselor, the parent, the student, has to see that reshoring is happening so that it makes sense to invest the resources, uh, risk the career, et cetera, and take advantage of that. So I mentioned the total cost of ownership estimator. Here's a very small sample of the data that goes in. This is maybe a third of the data. And basically, you put data in for the US case and for the other case. I'll typically talk about China, because China is, is the 800-pound gorilla in most manufacturing industries in terms of offshoring. So you put in the price, in China's case 70, US case 100, the quantity 12,000, just a, a typical example, the weight, all the data you need to, to, to do calculations of duty and freight and things like that. And then some softer things like the impact on innovation. When you, when you separate the, the engineering from manufacturing, innovation declines. When you bring it back together, it gets better. And then that, that's worth something. And I'll, I'll tell you some stories about that. Intellectual property risk. Things like that. So some sort of some hard firm things and some softer things 
that have to, uh, items that have to be considered. And the once you've put all the input in, this is what the output looks like. You can see the uh, Chinese price at 70 and the U.S. price at 100. So typically the buyer would look at that and say, huh, I can get it for 30% less in China or India, you know, wherever it happens to be. And I'm ordering 12000 a year. That's $360,000 per year uh, purchase price variance. That's a third of my annual objective. I'll get my bonus. I'm going to send the work off off to wherever. And, and the objective is to get that individual to do total cost and see that for from offshore it's 98 and for the U.S. it's 108. So now there's only 10% difference. And, and, and the total cost going forward, assuming a Chinese wage inflation less than historical and the U.S. staying at about 2%, uh, you wind up with the Chinese total cost in about three years being higher than the U.S. total cost. And, and then hopefully the supply chain person says, huh, I should probably stop sending any more categories of work offshore, and I should start planning to reshore. I should be expanding our own capacity, hiring, buying equipment. I should be going to my local uh, suppliers and asking them to be ready, because within a few years, strategically, we will be bringing work back to the United States. But we have to educate these people to, make, to do this analysis and see what's actually coming. We take, when people come on and use our total cost of ownership estimator, we, uh, we, we protect their confidentiality. We don't even ask their company name, because I know they wouldn't want their cost data disclosed. But we analyze the data in aggregate. And when we do that, uh, we define the, the total cost to be 100. And on average, landed cost is about 87% of the total cost, and purchase price about 77%. So the, so the red area is an approximation of the amount of the cost that the uh, purchasing agent was ignoring when they used those more simplistic measures. Uh, many of you are lean. Most of your customers are lean. Deming in uh, out of the crisis, this fourth key principle, end the practice of awarding business on the basis of price tag. Instead, minimize total cost. But it seems intuitively obvious. Sounds like something that uh, Moses might have had you know, along with the Ten Commandments. It just seems, how could you think of doing anything else? And yet the companies that are lean uh, typically ignore this aspect of lean. So here I've taken the uh, seven Toyota wastes, which is how most companies do lean. They, they minimize or eliminate the seven Toyota wastes. And I've shown how offshoring makes each waste worse. And uh, I'm not going to go into it in detail, but if you, when you get the presentation, you can look at it. And it, it's, a, it's a good argument you know, for you to make better sourcing decisions and a good argument to, for making your, helping your, your customers make better sourcing decisions and therefore to buy from you. There's, we've all read about the shale, shale gas and fracking. And the result of that is expected to be a, a 100 billion, that's with a B, investment in refineries that will take the shale gas and convert it into polyethylene, polypropylene, eventually into resins and things like that. And, and so for, for this $100 billion investment, there's going to be, there is ton, tons of, of uh, valves and fittings and things, so some of which will be castings. So that, that should already be helping you. And then when this has finished, at the peak, there's going to be like a quarter million 250,000 people building all this stuff. But eventually, when we get down to steady state, there will be something like 47,000 people running these refineries, working in the refineries. So, so, and that's all work that, if it had not been for shale gas, all of that uh, chemical processing would have been done offshore. So, so the result of the shale gas is energy costs are down a little bit. You, you, you should be seeing that, the natural, specifically natural gas, if you're using it. And the uh, and in addition, the prices of plastics and other relevant industrial chemicals at the least should be more stable and, and I think somewhat advantageous here relative to the rest of the world. So, so reasons for more people to use more plastics. You may not like that. You'd rather have castings, but at least it's, it supports the general reshoring uh, concept. Now, there are counterarguments. 
We do have a skilled labor shortage, as I mentioned. We, we don't have management uh, in some areas. The, the Chinese, the Japanese, others continue to do currency manipulation, which puts us at a disadvantage. We, in some categories, we, we lack the ecosystem. So for example, uh, Steve Jobs was asked, why, why don't you bring back the iPhone to the US? And he said, because there are so many components that are sourced in Asia, and it makes more sense to assemble the product where the, from where the components are sourced. Now, uh, that there's a change in that. As, we start, as we've come back and started to get more uh, consumer electronics here, uh, suppliers are starting to build factories to strengthen and replenish our ecosystem. There's a cost of transition. For example, I, I work with a company in, in New England, and they buy a lot of die castings in China. And, and they, they've adapt, uh, adopted or adapted our, our total cost of ownership system. And they, they found that to bring the die casting dies back from China, that the dies were so primitive, crude, simple, shimmed kind of thing, that the US die casters refused to use them. Uh, and this is relatively low volume. It's not automotive production, but low volume. And, and so what the company has done is leave the ones that are already over there there but as a new product comes out, have dies made in the U.S. and and have the die casting done here in the U.S. So there's costs of transition. There's there's a, a lack of political commitment. The Chinese government will you know do what it has to do to get a big factory there. You know bulldoze the village, do what it takes. Whereas in the U.S. it takes sometimes decades to get decisions made and get things implemented. So we have we have disadvantages. So there's counter arguments for this. It's not it's not simple. It's not easy, but it is happening. Uh, so here's a, a group of reshorers. You can see some of the bigger companies up here at the top. You recognize the, the logos, and m many of them, you know, Whirlpool, Caterpillar, Ford, GE, you know, pretty heavy casting users. And then there's some smaller OEMs. You see some of them down here. And then there's uh, contract manufacturers. So I put up here Wright Engineered Plastics, or an injection molder out in California. Ace is a uh, metal fabricator for the aerospace industry. And I'd, I'd love to have a couple of foundries up here. If, if you fellows will report your cases of reshoring, then I can put your logos up here and, and uh, make clear that the foundry industry is also bringing work back, is competitive. So the best, best single case of reshoring is GE. They, they have the Appliance Park in Louisville, Kentucky. And this, this place is big. At its peak, it had 20,000 employees. And it's so big that the parking lot has traffic lights. So it's just like a city. And it, it had declined to maybe 2,000, something like that. The GE had tr repeatedly tried to sell it. Nobody would buy it at an acceptable price. Heavily unionized facility. And they finally brought back uh, uh, 1,300 jobs, invested something approaching 1 billion, that's with a B, dollars in this facility. And, and actually have decided that that offshoring is history for GE appliance, at least for the appliance division of GE. And the two things I'd like to emphasize are in red. First, this, this one about design collaboration. Uh, they, they brought back, uh, they, they, they shipped over to the US some of the water heaters that they were making in, in China, put them in the war room, and they had the marketing people, uh, design engineers, uh, manufacturing engineers, foremen, worker, the fixture designer, everybody got together and they worked on this for months. And the end result was that the the product now made in the US, redesigned and made in the US, is more energy efficient than the one that they were importing from China. The warranty costs have been reduced. And the product was so simplified that despite the dramatically higher US labor costs per hour, the manufacturing cost was reduced enough that they sell the product, the US made product at retail in the US for 20% less than the product that they were importing from China. So you've got a higher quality, better performing product selling for less made in the US than when it was made in China. And why? why? Because they were able to put the, the engineers and the factory people together and innovate and reduce the labor content enough. Second item in red. When it was all done, the Chinese manufacturing cost was still below the US manufacturing cost. But when 
G looked at all of the costs, all of the everything else that they they decided that they can sell the product for less in the U.S. made in the U.S. than when it was made in China. So the the importance of looking at total cost. <clears throat> another important consideration or another important example: Walmart. Most of you have read about their commitment to buy 250 billion dollars of product made in USA over the next 10 years. And uh, they're very serious. I've been to some of their events. I've talked to them. As an example, they worked with this company, 1888 Mills, in Georgia. And they went to the company and said, we need a gazillion towels. And, and, the, and the company said, well, we can't make that many, and we're not willing to go out and invest you know, $100 million or whatever to, to expand capacity, because you could cut us off in a week. And, and Walmart gave them a longer-term commitment so that the company could justify making the investment. So, so if, if you've got customers that are, are producing for Walmart or might consider producing for Walmart, Walmart has become increasingly flexible because they, they have to make this commitment. They, they, they've, they've got their reputation hanging on it, and, and so it would be a good time to go after the Walmart uh, producers or potential producers. Another interesting case, Bailey Hydropower sells big hydraulic cylinders, the kind of things go into heavy machinery. And they had been producing a lot of them in India. They reshored to Tennessee. And the, the reason I find most interesting used to be when they were bringing them in from India, they'd open up the container, the 40-foot container, and they'd find bad cylinders. And, and, and already their deliveries were tight, and now they're really in trouble. And, and, they, and they say to themselves, huh, we've got another container a week behind that on the ocean, another one a week behind that, another one a week behind that. I wonder if those are good or those are bad. And if those are good, we're probably going to just get by. But if those are bad, we're going to lose key customers. So, so the company has to say, do I fly to India and fix the process and start air freighting good cylinders over, even though we may have good ones in the containers en route, or do we sit here and wait? And there's no way to make that decision in a, in a logical fashion because you can't get any data on the cylinders that are buried in the container ships coming across the ocean. So whereas if they were producing them in their own factory or 100 miles away, they you, know, you go to the factory, you, you fix the problem, maybe you lost two days of production, but you don't have this huge amount of uncertainty in your supply chain that there's no way to resolve. Uh, Caterp Caterpillar brought back uh, uh, some heavy production from Japan uh, to Texas, also to Athens, Georgia. So the, and I'm putting up here, I've, I've chosen products that have a fair amount of, uh, like, likely a fair amount of, of castings in them. Nissen, this is transplants now, but as I said, transplants are just about the same thing as, as reshoring, uh, brought back production. And we can, every, almost every, every couple months we get some kind of automotive announcement of, of transplant activity. Here's a, a diesel engine company transplanting uh, gearboxes for agricultural machinery. Again, sounds like castings to me. In fact, they brought back work to a Pennsylvania foundry. Uh, here, this Peerless uh, makes, a, I think, the, probably the highest end audio video mountings. You know, something that attaches to the wall, you hang your, your flat screen on it. And, and what they decided to do was do die casting in-house. And they've concluded that their in-house die casting is as competitive as it was from China. And in addition, they've cut inventory and improved lead time and all kinds of good things associated with it. Protected their intellectual property. Here's a uh, uh, aluminum uh, casting company, permanent mold. And uh, they have uh, brought back work from China. Another uh, casting company. Uh, one I deal with extensively, and I referred to them before, this Habarton Forge makes uh, lighting, very high-end lighting fixtures. And they, they brought back uh, die castings from uh, China to, to the US, or at least didn't stop offshoring new, new ones from uh, to China and are making them here in the US. And some of the things that they emphasized, uh, they have lower minimum order quantities here. The Chinese are typically demanding you know, container loads or something like that for castings. Supplier lead times are better. Uh, land, they, when they look at landed costs, uh, it, things look better, especially when they include the expedited freight costs when they head to. Uh, annual forecast quantities work out for them better. 
there's a whole series of advantages for them of sourcing in the U.S. instead of offshore. My, my favorite case is Whammo that brought back you know, frisbees and hula hoops, 50% of those from China to California and Michigan. And I like this because frisbees are pretty simple, the kind of things you'd think would be done in, in a developing country. And California and Michigan are not, are not the least expensive states in the United States. So if you can bring back frisbees to California, Michigan, you can bring back most things or many things somewhere in the United States. Repeated surveys show uh, a significant increase in the decisions by the big companies to bring uh, manufacturing back to, to reshore and also at the contract manufacturer level. You know, people like yourselves, MFG.com has surveyed and found that many of them are doing at least some reshoring. Uh, the whole trend is, is also accelerated by the fact that U.S. consumers increasingly prefer to buy a made-in-U.S. product and are less willing to buy a made-in-China product. And, and that, that trend has a couple of bases. The uh, made-in-USA quality has improved. We can see that in automotives and, and, and other products. Lean, ISO, all these things have helped. Uh, the Made in China product has had a series of issues with drywall, pet food, baby food, uh, etc. And so some of it's safety issues on the part of the consumer and some of it's just uh, nationalism. They, they understand that, that the decline in U.S. manufacturing is, has ravaged the U.S. economy and in the interest of themselves and their families and their neighbors, they're, they're willing to make the extra effort to find the the Made in USA product. It isn't as strong yet as we'd like, but it is definitely a trend. So you put all this together, and we, we conclude that the, you might say the bleeding has stopped. The, you know, the the, uh, the the patient is still somewhat anemic, but at least the bleeding has stopped. The back say 10 years ago, we were losing about 150,000 jobs a year to offshoring, and reshoring was never discussed. And I'm just absolutely guessing at it. At, at, uh, at, two, at 2,000, so, so net annual increase in offshoring was 150,000 jobs. And, and now uh, the offshoring and the reshoring, the incremental, the changes, the new things, roughly in balance around 30 to 50,000, which means the net loss is now about zero. And that still leaves us with 3 million or 4 million manufacturing jobs offshored, how do I get there from the trade deficit in manufactured goods of roughly 500, 600 billion with a B dollars a year, comes out to you know, three to four million manufacturing jobs, which with the multiplier effect gives you six or eight million or 10 million total jobs, which would have incredible impact on our uh, unemployment rate, uh, income equality, uh, budget deficit, you know, all kinds of things would, would be dramatically improved as we achieve that, that reshoring. Uh, I mentioned Boston Consulting Group. So they have identified the tipping point industries, the industries that will tip from being most efficiently supplied to North America from China to instead being most efficiently supplied to North America from US. Or, and so these are the industries they suggest uh, t tendency towards uh, bigger, heavier things, not, not much there in things like, apply, uh, like uh, apparel, for example. Now here's another view of this that you might find helpful. This is a study put out by Booz and Company, an another consulting company. Different industries, mach machinery, uh, auto, auto uh, furniture, etc. And, uh, and this axis over here is most interesting to me. It says, how competitive are US companies? And it, for this slide, it's how competitive are they exporting to China? And I draw a line through the center of gravity here. I come out to about minus 30%. So we're about 30% too expensive in our manufacturing costs to export to China. But this slide says, how competitive are we competing in the US market against Chinese imports. And when I draw that same line, I come out to about plus 10%. So on average, again, broadly distributed, but on average, US competitive companies are now competitive in the US competing against Chinese imports. Why is there such a big difference? The 
minus 30% in one case, plus 10% in the other, total 40% difference, because when we export there, we have all these hidden costs that go into the total cost, maybe 20%, and when they come here, they have all the hidden costs. You add the 20 plus 20, you get 40, and that's the, the minus 30 going up to the plus 10. Uh, the data here is from 2009, and very roughly one could shift everything up by about 10 percentage points on both charts to see which industries are now most competitive here. Logically, if you were marketing, where would you go? The ones that are shifting from being not competitive here to being competitive here, because they should be looking for more, more castings. So Booz and Boston Consulting Group say, from our analysis, here's what should happen. The Reshoring Initiative says, here is what is happening. So uh, we, we go into our library, and we categorize every company that's listed by w what industry it is in. And these are NAIC, N-A-I-C code industries. And you can see the number of published cases in each category. And so as, as a very rough summary, it's bigger, heavier things, uh, appliances, transportation equipment, machinery, things that are relatively big and and probably never should have been offshored because the freight cost, the delivery time uh, were, were not conducive to offshoring in, in the first place. Uh, fabricated metal products, I, I, I'm guessing that's where castings wind up. And, and not too many listed here, for a fair number, but the tendency first is if the company had been buying, say, castings or or machine parts offshore and just buys them here. There's, there's no articles written, so, it, so we don't get the record of it. And second, a lot of those products are, are that were coming in already assembled into the appliances and the transportation equipment and the machinery. Now that those end assemblies are assembled here, the companies are more likely to be buying the castings and the machine parts here. Here are the reasons for reshoring. You can see the, at the top of the list, hard, firm kind of things, wage and currency, quality, delivery, freight, the kind of things that you've always argued about and, and asked your customers to consider. And, and increasingly, companies are recognizing those factors and, and making their decisions based on them. Most of the work is coming back from China. And why is that? Because most of the work went to China, finally. And, and very little from Europe, Canada, uh, why? Uh, intellectual property, uh, not an issue, uh, language less of an issue, delivery a little better, uh, lo longer standing relationships, perhaps the, the U.S. company more likely to have its own factory in those locations as opposed to having outsourced to, into, say, a China or an India, and it's easier to break the outsourcing relationship than, the, than to shut your own factory offshore. Because this has economic implications. The government's gotten quite interested, so the Commerce Department in 2012 uh, got pretty aggressively behind total cost and, and uh, reshoring. Uh, four websites that link to ours. This one especially, ACE tool, assess costs everywhere. So you go to that site and you'll find maybe 20 pages as charts and data that compare intellectual property risk, natural disaster risk, all kinds of things for, for, for different countries to the US. So you get data that could be useful in our total cost of ownership estimator or in discussing the, your advantages versus your competitors. Uh, back in January of 2012, I had two calls from Washington one morning, one from the US-China Economic and Security Review Commission the other from the White House National Economic Council. And I said to myself, if I'm going to get two calls from Washington one day, better these two than the FBI and the IRS. And so that resulted in, in participating in the insourcing forum. That's President Obama's term for reshoring. And here's, here obviously is the president. And, and this, for those who don't know me, this is Harry. And when I send this to people that don't know me, I say, I'm the bold guy there talking to the President, and I was giving him some tips for the State of the Union message that was coming up in a few weeks, and he had me email them to his aide, but the, my tips did not make the cut for the State of the Union message. And then that afternoon, there was a panel on C-SPAN. This lady, Karen Mills, was the head of the SBA at the time, and uh, this is the bold guy again making, making the point. So 
uh, it, when when you or your customers are trying to decide, should I? What should I do? I, I'm not satisfied with the cost on this product. Should I uh, invest here, or should I just outsource, offshore it to, to to China or India or somewhere? Well, they can. Uh, it, it it's pretty easy to to sign the purchase order and buy it from somewhere else. Whereas it, it takes some work to do it here. And and if there's a if if they start off looking at the price or X works price difference. And say it's as in that other case, say it's thirty percent, and they try to they or you try to decide, can I get thirty percent out of my manufacturing cost? The answer is probably no. But if they first do total cost of ownership and see that there's only really a five percent difference in the total cost, and then they uh, look at they or you look at automation, look at training, look at lean and employee engagement, say, can I get five percent or ten percent out of my total cost? Well, the answer is probably yes. And so we, we say that before a company makes that decision of whether to do the, the easy thing and send it offshore or do the harder work of internally or with your supplier working on improving costs, first measure it properly. First look at, at total cost instead of just price. And then you'll see that the domestic so, uh, solution or alternative often is, is a good choice. The uh, what can you do about it? Uh, you can use the tools for sourcing and selling. Uh, you can uh, use our archive webinars to inform your staff and customers. You can post a link. There's a company that posted a link to, to us. Uh, you can uh, call on me to speak. I mean, let's say you sell heavily into the uh, automotive industry, let's say. You could work to get me onto some kind of conference at the automotive industry to be able to uh, help soften them up, get them thinking total cost. In fact, I'm I'm just starting to work uh, with a group, the AIAG, the Automotive Industry Action Group, that is developing a total cost of ownership kind of system that they're going to try to make standard throughout the automotive industry, and uh, so the companies will make better informed decisions. So I'm honored that they've. Uh, uh, that they're asking me to participate in that. You can submit your cases of reshoring uh, for publication. Uh, I talk to a lot of people that, that, that believe that the that U.S. foundries are, are not competitive. That, that they, I talk to companies that say that they're forced to go to India or wherever. And, and how, to, how to overcome that? Submit your cases of reshoring. Uh, communicate your successes. and and let, let the initiative and AFS both post them. Uh, call on us to help. You know, if you're t discussing with a customer and trying to convince him and you're, you maybe you're getting no, they're willing to listen, let's say, but you're not quite getting it done, then call on me to, over the phone, uh, emails, eventually visiting the customer if necessary to help you uh, convince them uh, to use total cost and make a, a more informed decision. So I mentioned, uh, uh, submitting your cases. When everybody who submits a valid case and we post it, they get a free Manufacturing is Cool t-shirt. And uh, th these are provided by MFG.com, the business-to-business -business portal. And uh, I, I would hope you'd want to be the first at your company to earn one of these by, by submitting a case. When you're selling, you know, you're at, the at a customer and and you're trying to convince them that they should be buying from you instead of offshore, focus on the kinds of arguments I've made. Uh, I find many of the supply chain managers would agree, but they, they have mandates to, to buy so much offshore. Uh, work with your natural allies. There are lean champions inside the companies that would agree with what I've said about lean. There are green champions who, who are you know, putting up the solar panels on the uh, retail store or the factory while they're off while the company is offshoring to China and every everything produced with dirty electricity and then and then shipping it halfway around the world uh, compliance people are concerned about regulations the quality individuals being impacted the line manager at the company is having too much inventory uh, too much travel uh, uh, intellectual property lost uh, can't deliver, you know, various of actual impacts, and so is being hurt. While the supply chain manager is getting a bonus 
for having offshore based on purchase price. So the, all these people could be your allies. And if, if you can't get, get to where you want to through the supply chain person, then see if you can find some allies within the company that can help you convince senior management to change the rules so the supply chain manager can uh, help you in what you have to do. Uh, so if you're if you're looking at a casting across the desk from a from a buyer and he says you'd have to match the Chinese or the Indian or whatever price, you know your your proper response is how about if I match the total cost of ownership or if I do a little better on the total cost of ownership? And when they say what do you mean, that's when you get them to watch a, the AFS webinar of this event. You you uh, call on us and uh, you convince them. So I, I mentioned skilled workforce before. The, uh, I, the Department of Labor called me into Washington about a year and a half ago. And I, I was in the, the uh, Department of Labor's, uh, uh, Secretary of Labor's uh, office in her conference room. And they wanted me to tell them how to get U.S. labor force ready for reshoring. And so I, I, I started off rather boldly saying, First, we have to recognize that the Department of Labor is a part of the cause of the problem, and they should become more of the solution. They, they said, what do you mean? They hadn't thrown anything yet. And I said, well, I pulled up their Bureau of Labor Statistics website site you see here, and I show, it shows that as the number of degrees goes up, the income goes up. And I said, this is the kind of data that drives the newspaper articles and the uh, commentators to say, everybody should go to university million dollars more lifetime income than if they uh, just got a high school degree. And I said, well, yeah, th that's statistically true, but this should say education and training pay, and we should have in here the average income of people that have passed an apprenticeship, uh, have uh, five or more certificates uh, like NIMS or AWS or, or the equivalent, uh, and show that those uh, that kind of training pays off as well as, say, a bachelor's degree does, especially a, an indeterminate bachelor's degree. And they said, you know, you're right. In fact, uh, a week later, uh, I was at another conference. I met uh, the secretary, an assistant secretary of labor. I walked up to him, introduced myself, and he, and he said, oh, Harry Moser, I heard about your meeting. We agree entirely we're going to do that. And, they, and, they've, and they've actually, they're actually implementing. So I, I've been very pleased to, to we were able to get them to change what they do because those subtle changes can make a huge difference in in the workforce that you will have going forward. So we have uh, some programs that we encourage you to implement in your community. One is to get the local high schools, community colleges, etc., to get rid of the term trades and vocations because no mother wants her kid to go to vocational school and instead call them professions in. In Germany and Switzerland, you have the tool and die pr profession, the foundry profession, the uh, precision machinist profession, the welding profession. Why is that? They're very well trained, trained by a master. They are very skilled. They do what they were trained to do, and they make an income that's comparable to the income of the, the average university graduate. And in fact, when I've taken tours to Switzerland, uh, I, we, we go to companies let's say 100 person to 1,000 person, and typically the president of the company is an ex-apprentice. They, they know the product, they know the process, they know the people, they know the company, they know the customers, and, and they do a much better job of running those companies than uh, a, sort of a parachuting in MBA would do here in the United States. Uh, another action, to uh, improve the image of manufacturing careers, to, which has been damaged by offshoring. And the idea there would be in your community to get the all of the companies to report their cases of reshoring on our website and then get the local newspaper, TV, radio to report the local reshoring cases of the month so as to get uh, all of those companies, all of the society, the teacher, the guidance counselor, et cetera, to see that reshoring is really happening and therefore it's safe to recommend Susie to go into the foundry industry. We also have a program for economic developers. So if you, if you know some economic developers in your community, you can tell them about this. And the basis of the program is that uh, the, the economic development group or the state goes to something called data mine. And data mine helps them identify 
what companies are bringing in substantial quantities of imports into the state, imports from, from outside the U.S. into the state, and those are and you can identify the economic developer can identify which of those are uh, logically competitively made here castings forgings or, you know wire harness machine parts you know whatever it is and then go to those companies and say why don't you make them or buy them here and the company says well the prices are too high here the wages are too high and then the economic developer says but how about looking at total costs you understand all of the implications and they do that, and some of it hopefully gets produced here or sourced here from you. And if there's now there's a 5% difference instead of a 30% difference on price, bring in the Manufacturing Extension Partnership, the community college, the economic developer, the, the automation suppliers, and get that final 5 or 10% out where it would not have been possible to get 30% out of the price. So this is a, a sort of a package that we have. We have two or three states starting to do it. And we, we have details on this. We'd be pleased to supply if you'd like to uh, pass this on to your community to help your community be stronger. So we're a not-for-profit. We have uh, uh, a range of, of sponsors. Uh, AMT puts on the big uh, machine tool show, IMTS, Society of Manufacturing Engineers, most of you know. Uh, Gardner puts out Modern Machine Shop and other publications. The company I used to run, GF Agi Charmé, and then other industry groups, uh, manufacturing associations, machine tool groups, machine tool distributors, etc. More of the same. U.S. Bank very very pleased to have as a as a sponsor, and and we're we're delighted as as Al mentioned to have uh, AFS as our long term sponsor. We, we we I've given a couple of speeches. Uh, and it's an honor now to do the webinar, and and we're really looking for you to use these tools and to report your cases of reshoring. When, when you report them, you don't have, do not have to identify the customer. I know everybody's sensitive about naming their customers, but you can say big appliance maker or Midwestern billion dollar company or something like that and, and, and get the facts out there so we make it clear that increasingly you are competitive. So this is how we think of ourselves. We're the, uh, as the little Dutch boy. And and here, uh, this is the Holland, and this is the North Sea, and the dike keeps the, the North Sea out of Holland, especially during the storm. And the little Dutch boy is walking along in the dark, and he sees a hole, and the water's coming out, and the little stones are coming out, and the big stones are starting to shake a little. And he says to himself, well, I could run and get the village elders, but I think by the time I get back, the dike's gone, and the, f the fields are flooded with salt water, and we don't eat, and it's miserable. Or I put my finger in the hole and hold the dike together and stand there in the dark and wait for the village elders to come along the dark and find me. And, and the, uh, the, the parallel to this is this is the United States and this is offshoring and this is Harry when Harry had hair and, and you are the village elders. So if you say, well, Harry, I'm glad you're enjoying your retirement, well, then offshoring will probably get worse. But if, if you take this message and use it for your own sourcing, if you use it for as a sales tool for when you're convincing your customers to buy from you instead of offshore, then we'll have uh, less offshoring, more reshoring, and uh, the U.S. economy, the, the foundry industry, will be better places, stronger, stronger, and, and this will be a better country for our children and our grandchildren. So I, I look forward to you being the, the activist uh, village elders and, and helping make this happen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Harry, for, uh, for the webinar. Um, before we get on to any questions, and if you do have questions, please type them into uh, the box on the dashboard on the right-hand side of your screen. Type those in, and then we'll ask them of Harry one at a time. Uh, I do have a, a quick announcement. If you are interested uh, in this webinar, uh, you will be, you'll be receiving an email uh, at some point in the next day or so uh, with links to the recorded webinar as well as links to some of the tools related to reshoring. Uh, so that will come, as an attendee of this webinar, that will come directly to your email box. Um, we have a little bit of time for questions for Harry, so if you do have any questions, uh, please type them in, again, to the question section on the dashboard, and we will field those and pass them over uh, to Harry. Um, I do have one question here that's come in. 
Um, the question is, why will reshoring or why does reshoring uh, take so long to happen? It feels like it's been and talked about ad nauseum for the last several years, especially since the recession, but companies are still so slow uh, to be able to have uh, reshoring taking place within their purchasing departments. It's been slow to have a lot of data out there. There's anecdotal evidence, but not a lot of data. So I know you touched on a little bit, Harry, in the webinar, but why does it take so long? Well, I'd say we're the source of data. So if you want the data, come to us. The Commerce Department doesn't, does not do it, probably can't do it. Um, there's there's cultural things. The, the supply chain manager is getting the bonus based on purchase price variance, and so that's great for them and for for many senior managers. And whereas the if they instead decide to do it the hard way and do the innovation and the and the automation and the training, that takes years to get done. So uh, so it's e it's easier for them to get the money this way. Uh, that's one case. So second, it takes work to do total cost as opposed to price. Price is easy. Total cost takes work to just to get the data together. Uh, third, there's thousands of people, consultants, still helping companies offshore, and there's you're talking right now to most of the people that are helping them reshore. <laughs> you know, so so we're outnumbered horribly. The uh, I I think a uh, another reason is that you know, companies to some extent have built their own factories offshore. And, it's, and once you've built a factory, it's hard to get out of that factory. So it takes time to transition. Um, and and it's a, uh, uh, it, there's also the skilled workforce issue. If, if, if we brought back all everything that's offshore now, which is roughly the trade deficits, so roughly $500, $600 billion a year, which is which is roughly three to four million manufacturing jobs. That's a 30 to 40 percent increase in U.S. manufacturing jobs, including the, in the skilled, what I call skilled professions. We don't have enough now. We certainly don't have enough for 30 to 40 percent more production. So if, if I could get every company to, to reshore everything today, your deliveries would be, you'd, you'd have a great time, but your deliveries would be so bad that you'd lose the orders again to offshore because you couldn't deliver. So, so it's going to, unfortunately, it's going to take uh, decades to do, bring back just like it took, you know, five decades or six decades to lose. But that's going to happen uh, if 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 we could net bring back a hundred thousand jobs a year, hundred thousand manufacturing jobs a year, a million over a decade. You know, or maybe maybe 150,000 a year, and if that could happen within four or five years, I I I I'd, I'd feel I'd be delighted with the progress we've made. Another question: The focus is often on the purchasing managers of the world and getting them to think. But are the top CEOs at some of these manufacturers being approached to cooperate with some of your reshoring initiatives? Uh, I'm doing a couple of things. First, I fairly often speak at the uh, MBA programs at uh, universities. I've been to Ohio State, Clemson, Georgia State, three or four others, and, and train the MBAs now so when they become those top managers that they'll make better decisions. I've spoken at uh, three or four uh, academic conferences where the professors that teach this kind of course go. Um, so so that, that's, that's for the future. Uh, also, I've been brought in to speak to uh, investment bankers, uh, private equity companies, and uh, stock market analysts to educate them on this with the intent that when they talk to chief, chief financial officers and, and CEOs and say, how are you making your, your offshoring, reshoring decisions? Are you using purchase price or using total cost? You know, to, to try and dig into them from the top and get them to make the better decision. Um, well, thank you very much, Harry, uh, for all your time today and for the presentation. As I mentioned Al, Al, earlier, I've got, I've got one oh, thing go ahead, to add. Sir. I noticed one Please. slide, maybe two thirds of the way through, where I mentioned Canada, and that was left over from the presentation I made in Montreal two weeks ago. So it, it, I should have caught it when we were coming through. So oh, if no anybody worries, just that, noticed that on Canada, Canada, you know, Canada is part of the team. But if I'd caught it, 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 I probably wouldn't have left that in. So the guys in the U.S., that wasn't intended as a snub of any kind. Yeah. Our, our Canadian metal casters that were in attendance on today's webinar were probably cheering that we referenced Canada. <laughs> oh, so. 
Um, as I mentioned, the recorded webinar as well as some of the other tools will be emailed out to all participants in the webinar today. Uh, and if you have any questions, Harry's contact information is on there. Uh, thank you much, uh, very much, Harry, for your time today, and thank you everyone for attending this morning's webinar. Enjoy thank the rest you, of your Al. afternoon. Bye-bye.